dear friends in Christ, on this most holy night in which our Lord Jesus passed over from death to life, the church invites her members dispersed throughout the world to gather in vigil and prayer. For this is the Passover of the Lord, in which by hearing his word and celebrating his sacraments, we share in his victory over death. Let us pray. O oh God, through your Son, you have bestowed upon your people the brightness of your light. Sanctify this new fire and grant that in this Paschal feast we may so burn with heavenly desires that with pure minds we may attain to the festival of everlasting light through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ yesterday and today, the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. By his holy and glorious wounds, may Christ our Lord guard us and keep us. Amen. May the light of Christ, rising in glory, banish all darkness from our hearts.
the light of Christ. The light of Christ. The light of Christ.
Rejoice now, heavenly hosts and choirs of angels, and let your trumpets shout salvation for the victory of our mighty King. Rejoice and sing now all the round earth, bright with a glorious splendor. Oh, darkness has been vanquished by our eternal King. Rejoice and be glad now, Mother Church, and let your holy courts in radiant light resound with the praises of your people. All you who stand near this marvelous and holy flame, Pray with me to God the Almighty for the grace to sing the worthy praise of this great light. Through Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. to the Lord our God. It is It is truly right and good, always and everywhere, with our whole heart and mind and voice to praise you the invisible, almighty, and eternal God, and your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who at the feast of the Passover paid for us the debt of Adam's sin, and by his blood delivered your faithful people. This is the night when you brought our fathers, the children of Israel, out of bondage in Egypt, and led them through the Red Sea on dry land. This is the night when all who believe in Christ are delivered from the gloom of sin and are restored to grace and holiness of life. This is the night when Christ broke the bonds of death and hell and rose victorious from the grave. How wonderful and beyond our knowing, O oh God, is your mercy and loving kindness to us that to redeem a slave you gave a son. How holy is this night when wickedness is put to flight and sin is washed away. 
it restores innocence to the fallen and joy to those who mourn. It casts out pride and hatred and brings peace and concord. How blessed is this night when earth and heaven are joined and man is reconciled to God. Holy Father, accept our evening sacrifice, the offering of this candle in your honor. May it shine continually to drive away all darkness. May Christ, the morning star who knows no setting, find it ever burning. He who gives his light to all creation and who lives and reigns forever Let us hear the record of God's saving deeds in history, how he saved his people in ages past, and let us pray that our God will bring each of us to the fullness of redemption. You may be seated. The story of creation. God created the heavens and earth. All you see, all you don't see. Earth was a soup of nothingness, a bottomless emptiness, an inky blackness. God's spirit brooded like a bird above the watery abyss. God spoke, light, and light appeared. God saw that light was good and separated light from dark. God named the light day. He named the dark night. It was evening. It was morning. Day one. God spoke, sky, in the middle of the waters, separate water from water. God made a sky. He separated the water under sky from the water above sky. And there it was. He named the sky the heavens. It was evening, it was morning, day two. God spoke, separate water beneath heaven, gather into one place, land appear. And there it was, God named the land earth. He named the pooled water ocean. God saw that it was good. God spoke. Earth, green up. Grow all varieties of seed-bearing plants. Every sort of fruit-bearing tree. And there it was. Earth produced green seed-bearing plants, all varieties and fruit-bearing trees of all sorts. God saw that it was good. 
It was evening, it was morning, day three. God spoke, lights come out, shine in heaven's sky, separate day from night, mark seasons and days and years, lights in heaven's sky to give light to earth. And there it was. God made two big lights, the larger to take charge of day, the smaller to be in charge of night. And he made the stars. God placed them in the heavenly sky to light up earth and oversee day and night, to separate light and dark. God saw that it was good. It was evening. It was morning, day four. God spoke, swarm ocean with fish and all sea life. Birds fly through the sky over earth. God created the huge whales, all the swarm of life in the waters, and every kind of species of flying birds. God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Prosper, reproduce, fill ocean, Birds reproduce on earth. It was evening. It was morning. Day five. God spoke. Earth, generate life, every sort and kind. Cattle and reptiles and wild animals, all kinds. And there it was wild animals of every kind, cattle of all kinds, every sort of reptile and bug. God saw that it was good. God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature, so they can be responsible for the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself, and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. God created human beings. He created them godlike, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them, prosper reproduce, fill earth, take charge, be responsible for fish in the sea and birds in the air, for every living thing that moves on the face of the earth. Then God said, I've given you every sort of seed-bearing plant on earth and every kind of fruit-bearing tree, given them to you for food, to all animals and all birds, everything that moves and breathes, I give whatever grows out of the ground for food. And there it is. God looked over everything he had made. It was so good, so very good. It was evening, it was morning, day six. Heaven and earth were finished down to the last detail. By the seventh day, God had finished his work. On the seventh day, he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day. He made it a holy day because on that day, he rested from his work all the creating God had done. This is a story of how it all started, of heaven and earth when they were created. Thank you.
Let us pray. O God, who wonderfully created and yet more wonderfully restored the dignity of human nature, grant that we may share the divine life of him who humbled himself to share our humanity, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Israel's deliverance at the Red Sea. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were the Egyptians advancing on them. 
In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians. For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to go forward, but you lift up your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it, that the Israelites may go into the sea on dry ground. Then I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And so I will gain glory for myself over Pharaoh and all his army, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gained glory for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots, and his chariot drivers. The angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved and went behind them and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the army of Israel, and so the cloud was there with the darkness, and it lit up the night. One did not come near the other all night. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry land, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, let us flee from the Israelites for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at dawn, the sea returned to its normal depth as the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. Thus, the Lord saved Israel that day from the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant, Moses. 
Then the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand, and all the women went out after her with the tambourines and with dancing. And Miriam sang to them, Sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. Horse and rider he has thrown into the sea. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed. He has triumphed gloriously. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed. He has triumphed gloriously. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed. He has triumphed gloriously. I will sing to the Lord.
Let us pray. O God, whose wonderful deeds of old shine forth even to our own day, you once delivered by the power of your mighty arm your chosen people from slavery under Pharaoh to be a sign for us of the salvation of all nations by the water of baptism. Grant that all the peoples of the earth may be numbered among the offspring of Abraham and rejoice in the inheritance of Israel through Jesus Christ, our Lord. A new heart and a new spirit. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I give to your ancestors and you shall be my people and I will be your God.
in him and not be afraid, and not be afraid. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal Mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who are reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The Gathering of God's People. Sing aloud, O daughter Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness, he will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you shall not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time. And I will save the lame and gather the outcast and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home, at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord.
and the sound of the horn. Shout with joy before the King the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it, the land and all those who dwell therein. Sing to the Lord and hold his song. Hear this and marvelous Let us pray. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery. By the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Candidates for Holy Baptism will now be presented. I present Olivia Grace to receive the sacrament of baptism. I present Ethan Derrick to receive the sacrament of baptism. I, I present Jacqueline Marie to receive the sacrament of baptism. Olivia, Ethan, Jackie, do you desire to be baptized? I do. Do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? I renounce them. Do you renounce the evil powers of this world, which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God? I renounce them. Do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? I renounce them. Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your savior? Do you put your whole trust in his grace and love? I do. Do you promise to follow and obey him as your Lord? I do. Invite the congregation to stand as you are able. And I ask, will you who witness these vows do all in your power to support these persons in their life in Christ? We will. Through the Paschal Mystery, dear friends, we are buried with Christ by baptism into his death and raised with him to newness of life. I call upon you, therefore, now that our Lenten observance is ended, to join with those who are committing themselves to Christ and renew the solemn promises and vows of holy baptism by which we once renounced Satan and all his works and promised to serve God faithfully in his holy Catholic Church. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, 
creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in the prayers? I will, with God's help. Will you persevere in resisting evil? And whenever you fall into sin, repent and return to the Lord. I will. Will you proclaim by word and example the good news of God in Christ? Will you seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving your neighbor as yourself? And will you strive for justice and peace among all people and respect the dignity of every human being? Let us now pray for these persons who are to receive the sacrament of new birth. Deliver them, O Lord, from the way of sin and death. communion of your holy church. Lord, hear our prayer. Teach them to love others in the power of the Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer. Send them into the world in witness to your love. and glory. Grant, O Lord, that all who are baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, your Son, may live in the power of his resurrection and look for him to come again in glory, who lives and reigns now and forever. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. We thank you, Almighty God, for the gift of water. Over it, the Holy Spirit moved in the beginning of creation. Through it, you led your children, you led the children of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt into the land of promise. And it's your son, Jesus, received the baptism of John and was anointed by the Holy Spirit as the Messiah, the Christ, to lead us through his death and resurrection from the bondage of sin into everlasting life. We thank you, Father, for the water of baptism. In it we are buried with Christ in his death. By it we share in his resurrection. Through it we are reborn by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in joyful obedience to your Son, we bring into his fellowship those who have come to him in faith, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, sanctify this water, we pray you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, that those who here are cleansed from sin and born again may continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Savior, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> Olivia Grace. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Olivia, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism, and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Receive the light of Christ and carry it into the world. Amen. Amen. Ethan Derrick, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Amen. Amen. Receive the light of Christ and carry it into the world. Amen. Amen. Jacqueline Marie, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jacqueline, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Receive the light of Christ and carry it into the world. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you that by water and the Holy Spirit you have bestowed upon these your servants the forgiveness of sin and have raised them to the new life of grace. Sustain them, O Lord, in your Holy Spirit. Give them an inquiring and discerning heart, the courage to will and to persevere, a spirit to know and love you, and the gift of joy and wonder in all your works. Amen. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We receive you into the household of God. Confess the faith of Christ crucified, proclaim his resurrection, and share with us in his eternal priesthood. As I went down 
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, who made this most holy night to shine with the glory of the Lord's resurrection, stir up in your church that spirit of adoption which is given to us in baptism, that we, being renewed both in body and mind, may worship you in sincerity and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A lesson from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a, a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For, for whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord.
Santo Evangelio de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, según Marcos. Pasado el sábado, María Magdalena, María la Madre de Santiago y Salomé compraron perfumes para perfumar el cuerpo de Jesús. Y el primer día de la semana fueron al sepulcro muy temprano. Apenas salido el sol, diciéndose unas a las otras, ¿Quién nos quitará la piedra de la entrada del sepulcro? Pero al mirar, vieron que la piedra ya no estaba en su lugar. Esta piedra era muy grande. Cuando entraron en el sepulcro, vieron, sentado al lado derecho, a un joven vestido con una larga ropa blanca. Las mujeres se asustaron, pero él les dijo, No se asusten. Ustedes buscan a Jesús de Nazaret, el que fue crucificado. Ha resucitado. No está aquí. Miren el lugar donde lo pusieron. Vayan y digan a sus discípulos y a Pedro, Él va a Galilea para reunirlos de nuevo. Allí lo verán, tal como les dijo. Entonces las mujeres salieron huyendo del sepulcro, pues estaban temblando, asustadas. Y no dijeron nada a nadie, porque tenían miedo. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, and had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised, he is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you.
In the name of the risen Christ, amen. Sometimes we just have to move toward the light while it's still dark. Sometimes we have to move toward love, even when we don't feel it. We have to move toward life, even if it feels like we're going through the motions of life because we don't feel it anymore. Moving toward light when it's still dark is awkward and it's tentative, but there are times when we simply need to move. We have to go. And on that first Easter Eve, early morning, it was the women of Jesus' inner circle who moved. They, they went first. Not that they had any idea that that's what they were doing. They rose that night from the stupor of grief, fully expecting to anoint a dead body. That's how it works. Someone hears something in the middle of the night and gets up and moves. And in the movement, something happens and the dawn breaks. And, and if you notice, it's a, it's a collective experience. Like it's happening for a bunch of people, but someone has to go first and make a path so others can follow. So they did. And what they experienced was beyond credulity. And so they said nothing to anyone of what they heard and saw because they were afraid. Well, so says that text. But eventually they did tell somebody, despite their fear, no doubt struggling to believe what the young man had told them as much as those first listening to that bizarre story. There's another version, there's a lot of versions of this story, by the way. In one of them, the young man who spoke at the tune, he becomes an angel. And then another, you remember, it's Jesus himself who appears in the garden, rather than telling them to go to Galilee to meet him there. And there's another version where the men eventually show up at the tomb, after the women, just saying. In another, the, those men gather together in fear in the same room where they had shared their final meal with Jesus. And in another, you remember there were two of the men who were so bereft, they simply had to move, but they went out of town, walking toward another town called Emmaus. And then there was one more that we know of where they all go back to Galilee, as Jesus said, and they resume their previous lives as fishermen. So all these variations of the earliest accounts of when Jesus shows up, um, and for all the differences, there's this one common thread. He appears to them after the resurrection. He appears to them in ways that are otherworldly in the sense that he wasn't resuscitated, you know? Um, he was alive, but it wasn't like before, and everybody knows that. But at the very same time, these appearances are strikingly mundane. He shows up as they're going through the motions of life, which made it all rather frightening and wonderful and strangely normal. I can't speak to you from personal experience about what happened back then. Um, and I don't know what happens, personal experience. I don't know what happens on the other side of death. But this I know, that on this side 
of that final crossing over. Resurrection happens when it happens in the midst of life. Something or someone dies. And with that something or someone, a part of us does too. We die. And for a while, sometimes a very long time, we live as though dead ourselves. And if the loss is deep enough, well, that's just fine with us. And resurrection is this mysterious process of life emerging again out of that death. And it always begins really small, in a very dark hour, a seed of light and life somehow stirs, and we get up. And before we know what's happening, we're moving toward what lies ahead. Now to anybody watching us, we're just going about our day, and we are. But something's changed, and we know it. To have faith in this mysterious process doesn't require us casting a blind eye to all that is not or has not yet been touched by it. In other words, we don't have to pretend that the world isn't on fire. And we know even now, tonight, as we gather here in relative safety, others are huddled in fear and fear for their lives. And we know this, and we have to hold that grief for them and our own grief um, with us now. And we don't have to surrender our confusion, even anger, in the face of all that we don't understand. It's not required of us. So this afternoon, I was speaking on the telephone with an old friend, someone I've known and loved for over 30 years. She and her family were active in the very first congregation I served as a priest. This was back in Toledo, Ohio, in the first five years of my ordained life. And she, she is our younger son's godmother. And so after we were catching up on family and other things, I asked her what her plans were for Easter. And she said, Oh, and by the way, she stopped going to church a long time ago, and, and I knew that. Um, and she said, well, this wasn't the conversation I was planning on having with my friend, the bishop, this weekend. But since you asked, I need to tell you that of all the Christian holidays, this is the one I really struggle with. I just don't know what to do with this notion or make sense of this notion that Jesus died for our sins. I mean, it doesn't bother me to be around people for whom it does make sense. I think she was talking about me. But it's a real stumbling block, she said, and I've been thinking about it all weekend. I was just asking her who she was having over for dinner, right? <laughs> and I was talking to her in my car. And I wasn't, and so finally I said rather lightheartedly, well, you know, you're the very first person I've met to struggle with this. <laughs> I'm so glad you laughed. Um, she, she did too, which was good. But then I assured her that this was a subject of intense debate within Christianity throughout the ages. And as a result, there's a lot of material and a lot of ways to think about Jesus' death and our sin. Um, and I was making a mental catalog of all the helpful articles I would send to her. Um, and then I, then I stopped for myself and, um, and I said, you know, but before we have this conversation, it would really help me to know what you mean when you say Jesus died for our sins. Like what it is about that phrase that you're struggling with, because even that phrase means very different things to different people. Well, by then I had met my, reached my destination and we had to stop. Um, but I've been thinking about her, obviously, since then, and it occurred to me 
that there was one story in particular that best expresses my understanding of what that phrase, Jesus died for our sins, means. And it doesn't speak to me intellectually, um, but poetically. It doesn't answer all the questions I have, but it never fails to speak to my heart and, and to my experience. So I decided I was going to tell you this story tonight. And in doing so, I honor a, a very dear friend who has since died, who shared it with me years ago. It's not my story, but it, it feels like mine. That's how deeply it speaks to me of forgiveness and love and what Jesus makes possible for us. So this is for you, Perry Epps. The story is found in a trilogy, The Seed and the Sower, written by the South African author Lawrence Vanderpost. And it begins with the haunting confession of a young British soldier. I had a brother once, and I betrayed him. He goes on, the betrayal in itself was so slight that most people would find betrayal too exaggerated a word. Yet as one recognizes the nature of the seed from the tree and the tree by its fruit and the fruit by the taste on the tongue, so I know the betrayal from its consequences and the tyrannical flavor it left behind in my emotions. So as you can see straight away, this is a tale of shame. The shame that this young man who was blessed with physical beauty and intelligence felt toward his brother, who was, in contrast, slightly deformed, quiet, and self-conscious. His brother's only gift, it seemed, was that of song, hardly anything in comparison to the other's many talents. Few noticed this gift, and even it became a source of curiosity among other boys. And the young man felt his younger, the, 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 the narrator felt his brother's deformity as an embarrassment, as a threat to his own identity. And so while he was on the surface of their relationship, very protective and affectionate inside, he felt resentful. And the time came for the brother to join him at boarding school, and when the hazing rituals began, humiliating experience for any boy, his brother was particularly humiliated and scorned, and he felt that he ought to say something, but he did nothing but watch from a distance, avoiding his brother's increasingly desperate eyes that searched for him in the mocking crowds. And afterwards, he made light of his brother's pain, and they never spoke of it again nor did his brother ever sing again. Years pass, and during World War II, the older brother finds himself in Palestine as a soldier in the British Army, and he meets an old priest who becomes his friend. And the priest tells him that every year at Easter, he walks the seven-mile walk between Jerusalem and Emmaus to remember Jesus' Jesus' encounter with the two disciples on the road. I walk only at night, the priest tells him, to remind myself of all the ways I fail to recognize Jesus in the daylight of my life. That Easter night, the soldier joins him. It was an unremarkable experience. But afterwards, he became quite ill with a recurring bout of malaria. Fevered and hallucinating, he dreams of the resurrected one on the road. Where is Judas? Jesus asks in the dream. We can't go on without him, Jesus says in prayer to God. And the soldiers listened as the other disciples explained to Jesus that Judas was dead, that he hanged himself in shame. And Jesus responds by looking up to heaven, this cannot be. If I fail at this, 
I fail at all else besides, his deed, too, must be redeemed. Then the man who's having the dream, in his dream, steps forward. I am Judas. Jesus smiles. Good. Now we both can be free. But I'm not free, the man confessed. I had a brother once, and I betrayed him. Jesus nod, nods with understanding and kindness. Then you must go to your brother and make your peace with him, even as I have had to do with my need for you. So on the next furlough, the man travels back to South Africa, finds his brother on their family farm, and acknowledges his guilt. The brother marveled, you came all the way here simply to say this to me? And when the soldier left to return to his military post, he heard his brother sing. And what I love about this story and why it speaks to me of Jesus dying for our sins isn't, it's not that it ends with such a satisfying reconciliation. Um, that rarely happens for me. Um, but what I love is uh, Jesus' question, where is Judas? And his insistence to God, we cannot go on with this without him. And I love the fact that this accomplished brother carried in his soul all his life the secret of his guilt, and it was there in that dark place that no one, save the priest, I suppose, who heard his confession, could see. And that's where Jesus met him and set him free. And I love that forgiveness comes with a path of restitution, a way to at least try to make things right as we can and to place ourselves in the work of rising, helping others to rise too. So yeah, I believe that Jesus died for our sins, but I also believe he rises for us rises for us and invites us to rise with him and to be a person of faith and hope and love in this world is a daily practice of small steps moving toward life in the service of life as we're going about our days even if it isn't the life we wanted or imagined even if we have done the worst possible thing, it's a grace that meets us where we are, but doesn't leave us there. It's an assurance of Christ's presence and in the heart of God that will never let us go and invites us to move toward him, toward life, and taking our part in the great mystery of resurrection. Amen. Please rise.
<laughs> Peace of the Lord be always with you. Please take a moment to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. Please be seated. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Welcome to Washington National Cathedral. My name's Randy Hollerith. I'm the Dean of the Cathedral. And on behalf of Bishop Buddy and all of us here, we're so glad that you're here with us tonight for this very special, what is really the oldest liturgy in Christianity. And so thank you for walking this path from darkness to light with us tonight. It's very special. I want to give a special welcome to our newly baptized and their families, and I think we should welcome them. <laughs> Baptisms on this night are always so joyful. Please know, my friends, that we move now into the Holy Eucharist, and everyone is invited to receive communion tonight, regardless of your church affiliation or lack thereof. If you desire to know Christ, then please come forward and be fed. We will be offering both bread and wine, and we have gluten-free bread for those who need it, so please don't hesitate to ask. If you'd rather not receive communion, you're welcome to stay in your seat, or, and I hope you will do this, I hope you will come up when other people come up and just cross your arms over your chest like this. That way we know you'd rather not receive communion, and we will just offer you a a blessing and a prayer. Finally, my friends, if you are able to support the cathedral this evening in our ministry, we would be most grateful. All of the funds that we raise come from private donation, and we are grateful for so many of you who share the bounty of your lives with us. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ lived, died, and rose for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
praying together, Lord God, our Father, through your, our Savior, Jesus Christ, you have assured your children of eternal life. You can rise now. You can rise and you can go and you can love. You can forgive and you can be all that God has created you to be. So go forth from this place in peace and joy and may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit go with you and remain with you this night and forevermore. Amen.
We are raised to a new life with Christ. Go in his peace, alleluia, alleluia. Thanks be to God.